Welcome to Victoria Rumble Room, an island show that endeavors to dig into the big issues locally, nationally, internationally. I'm Robin Adair, and across town is my partner in crime, the Croatian sensation himself, John Jurisic. And John, lots and lots of issues to dig into. As usual, Robin, so many. Uh, an issue a minute almost these days. However, what I love about our show these days is the feedback. We've had plenty of it from our last program where we discussed the lack of Justin Trudeau's judgment, i.e. being poor judgment, in taking a holiday at a luxury resort in Jamaica, which is owned by a major Trudeau Foundation contributor. Hello. Uh, we said aside from the investigation into Beijing's interference in our political process, that our prime minister keeps making life difficult for himself. I remember saying that. And thank you, Anne, for writing back to us saying, he's just making it very difficult now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Mark also sends us a note. He says, uh, yet you don't talk about the Chinese police stations in Canada. All of them need to go to jail. Wake up already. And, uh, you know, there definitely are some feelings at that grassroots level that there's a frustration with the prime minister. I think that's pretty clear to see. Um, he's in many ways telling us to do one thing and doing another himself. Everyone knows, everyone knows Justin Trudeau is a very wealthy man and no one honestly begrudges him a holiday. However, he should show better judgment and transparency if he's going to be spending time at the fancy resort owned by a big supporter who's paying for that who's laying down the money for that what money are taxpayers having to pay for this these are the questions that are not being answered and it certainly keeps him in the muck 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 you bet okay so to all of those who are somewhat criticizing our commentary around young justin trudeau yes there's a ton of muck we seem to live in an era when elites hold sway on much of our public discourse. They do. Uh, that's why we exist, the Rumble Room, to try to break through that a little bit. Canadian politics tend to shift back and forth between more conservative times and our current times of rapid social and economic change. And it seems many people feel like they've been pushed to the sidelines where this debate goes back and forth. And you know, I think the Times colonist has dug into this a little bit uh, under a headline about the BC Liberal Party and their change of name. The headline stated, along with new name, BC United needs a clear platform. And their commentary opens with the findings that the latest Angus Reid poll shows that BC United is drastically outgunned by the BC NDP to the tune of 45% for the NDP, 31 for BC United. Polling also points out the newly minted Premier David Eby's approval standings at 49%. Of course, the new Premier has been throwing billions of dollars of surplus money to various programs since taking office. So how can this be a surprise? Kevin Falcon only has 20% approval rating. The Times columnist then starts drumming on about Falcon being a traditional conservative, like Pierre Polyev, and how traditional conservative beliefs like smaller government, lower taxes, an emphasis on personal responsibility are somehow dated. The TC says that slow growth, high interest rates, and the post-COVID flight of office workers from our urban centers cannot be solved by small government. And, you know, that's kind of the gist of their commentary. But let me respond in this way. Taking personal responsibility in one's life, I would suggest, is not in any way, shape, or form an outdated idea. It's essential. It's essential for our society. The nanny state will not solve, certainly not alone, high housing prices, out of control crime, poverty, nor will reckless deficit spending solve all of our economic woes. There needs to be balance and fiscal responsibility with a social conscience, I would suggest, is a cornerstone of Canadian thinking. So 
The Times colonists should certainly remember this, especially when we have that next big political shift, because believe me, it's going to happen. And uh, on that, we'll shift over to something else, John, another important story on another stage, that being the war in Ukraine. Robin, it looks like the Ukrainian counteroffensive is about to begin. We've been told numerous times all over the place that spring would be that time. The big questions are, will Ukraine prevail? Push the Russians out of their country? Can this war end soon? What will happen next? Well, to help us understand the latest from Central Europe, we turn to a great friend, and frequent contributor to the Rumble Room on these issues. Chris Kilford is a university instructor, president of the Victoria branch of the Canadian International Council, and a former artillery officer and military attache. So let's zoom him in. Lieutenant Colonel Chris Kilford. So now joining us in the Victoria Rumble Room, one of our very favorite guests on international topics <laughs> uh, is Chris Kilford, a former retired Lieutenant Colonel in the Canadian Forces, who is currently the President of the Victoria Branch of the Canadian International Council. Welcome back, Chris. Yeah, I'm always pleased to be here, so uh, thanks for having me back. Well, there's all so much to talk about. We tend to talk to, about Ukraine with you. We, maybe we'll shift topics around and get into some other things, but let's talk about Ukraine today. Mm -hmm. It seems, from all accounts, and I watch this stuff very, very frequently when I, at the end of the day, I go over to Twitter and I go over to YouTube and I look at all the different information out of Ukraine. It would seem that at least the beginnings of a counteroffensive are underway right now. Do you think with the new supply of tanks and jets and equipment that this is the real deal and can it really work? Yeah, so it's coming. It may have started already. Well, let me restart that and say it has started already. It started months ago. <laughs> um, not that you would have seen it, um, because in these offensives, you're expecting to hear about big movements of troops and tanks and things getting, you know, um, um, you know, blown up for lack of a better term. But this, uh, the offensive would have started months ago uh, with what we would call like the preparation of the battlefield, so to speak. And that's bringing all of your intelligence sources into play, locating where Russian units are, where headquarters are, where air defenses are, pinpointing them and saying to, to yourselves, if we... Uh, launch this uh, this counteroffensive in the spring. Where exactly are we going to do it? Uh, in one spot or two or three? And then what do we actually have to have in place to make it succeed? So all of that work has been taking place while we've been watching and reading the newspapers and listening about all those leaks that have been occurring and all of that sort of thing. So so let's just say this has already started. Now we're picking. Now we're looking for the exact time. Will it be you know tomorrow that we see big troop movements or the next day? All I can say there is it's uh, 12 degrees centigrade on the ground in uh, in the region right now. It's going to be warming up over the next few weeks. You're starting to get into those conditions that you need to have an offensive succeed or not to get bogged down in 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 the terrain, so to speak. So, yeah, lots of preparations have been going on. We're just now waiting to see when we wake up in the morning and 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 there's some sort of breakthrough in in the in the russian lines hopefully um and then we'll watch and and see what what happens chris always so great to hear uh, your insights and and what's going on in europe um welcome back to the rumble room mm. uh canada is a nato member obviously and is a part of this military response in in different ways and means but new leaked documents show that Canadian officials have recently told NATO that we will not be reaching our NATO commitments. Apparently, it's too expensive. Do you believe these leaked documents, first of all? And do you think Canadians generally support our current NATO and international military capacity? So, uh, first of all, there would have been no surprises in NATO that Canada is not going to meet its commitments. And... Uh, uh, it, it, you know, I'd be surprised if 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 the prime minister actually said to somebody face to face, you know, forget it. I know we promised or made a pledge, but we're not interested, really. So I, I'm, I'm sus that's a bit 
a, 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 I, I don't, I'm not sure about that part, but there's no question that our allies would have, have already construed that um, time and time again over many decades. It's not like it's not like this is something new. Um, look, but, but you know that aside, um, for all the criticism that the government gets and previous governments have received about defense spending, we are around the 12th highest defense spender in the world. There's no escaping that fact, and we we have a lot of troops deployed ar around the world. And if we were to double the defense budget tomorrow, as some people say we should, well, then where is that money going to come from? You know, it's high taxes. Are you going to stop access to hospitals for people? Uh, you know, these are always the trade-offs you make. I think the government's been responsible at the end of the day in the way they, they come at these things. I think if you ask Canadians about the fighting in Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, they would understand that it's important that we you know join with our allies and we help Ukraine and, and we're going to carry this on through. And that yes, some war weariness creeps in as it goes on day after day. But I think overall, most Canadians would say, yes, I mean, this is the right thing to do. But then I think also if you ask Canadians about the spending, the, the billions of dollars, where the money goes, they would also say, look, I mean, this is this is um, you know, something that would be uh, ideally avoidable. You know, we don't want to be in this sort of situation where we're paying huge sums for for military uh, equipment and and all of this sort of thing when there's so many other demands that that we have in our our country. So the, the government always has to weigh these these things up. But the fact is, you know, you had a country, Russia, uh, decide to invade another country, and uh, it's caused untold destruction uh, for for Ukraine. And I think uh, you know m most Canadians would say this isn't right, and and we need to do something about it. So um, yeah, I want to dig back into security and also communications in this modern age. We're dealing with things we've never dealt with before. It's it's amazing how you see people being, being attacked in the streets or all sorts of terrible things, all captured on camera. And now with computers, information seems to flow here and there and everywhere. And uh, you, you represent an organization with the uh, Canadian International Council that a lot of veteran civilian diplomats, veteran military analysts and uh, I mean, how shocked are your members about what's happened? We have a, a very junior U.S. National Guardsman who has access to computers, and he gets on there. I think he's 21 years old, and he gets on there, gets these massive envelopes of top-secret documents, shares them with his buddies, and then they suddenly are wham all around the world. Mm. And, and what does this say about modern security and uh, 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 is it technology actually getting ahead of our 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 way of doing uh, doing business internationally? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's always been an issue. Actually, I remember being I served in Ankara as the defense attaché to uh, Turkey, and at, in the Second World War, the ambassador's valet was able to get into his briefcase and photograph documents and sell them to the Germans. So, this is something that's been going on for a very long time. But now, of course, with all of the computers that you you, you say, and and you know, after nine eleven, the the uh, pressures to share intelligence and not keep it to yourself, and then in stove stovepipes, you know, share it as widely as you can, but trying to protect it also from being leaked, etc. So sharing information comes with a price. I'm surprised it doesn't happen more often. And we never hear actually um, these sorts of document leaks from the Chinese or the Russian side of the house, because generally speaking, they never want to advertise these things. Whereas we 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 run around trying to find the culprits and publish it in our open and free media. So let me say that document leaks happen all the time, all over the place. Um, we tend to hear about the the big ones. I mean, look at all the leaks that go on all the time. You know, envelopes being passed. So, so this though is a particular, particularly interesting one because in that trove of documents, there was something for everyone. W whereas, you know, if I was the, on the Russian side, I would be, I would be very, very concerned because, um, first of all, it looks like the Americans seem to know awful an awful lot about you and what you're up to. And again, there are no real surprises there. Um, but then you would be looking at all of the equipment flowing into Ukraine. And I know the media said, oh, it doesn't paint a very good picture of the Ukrainian forces. They're, you know, they, they need more help. They don't have this. They don't have that. But part of that story would be that all the things that they have had flowing in, um, if you were Russian, you'd be thinking to yourself, oh, my, this is awful. You know, they've got 12 combat brigades that are near 
ready to go. They've had so many tanks and self-propelled artillery systems, American Patriot air defense systems, fighter jets, you name it. I mean, this is something that they they would, are not getting much on their side. So so there was something for everyone in in there. And um, I would I would you know any intelligence organization putting their hands on that range of documents, that treasure trove would be very, very suspicious about every single page. It's a really a, a very, very dramatic time, I think, in the history of this whole conflict, because if this uh, counteroffensive works, the whole discussion could change. If it fails, for the very opposite reasons, the discussion changes again. And I, I imagine this is something that uh, Vladimir Putin has to be counting on, that this could be good news for him in a sense. He already is calling up another 100,000 soldiers from across Russia. They've taken such serious losses in the first year. Now, do you believe after all this time, the Russian people are still standing by this? Is there more cynicism, do you think, in Russia? I know there's this this image of Russians of being kind of automatons. They're like the Borg and just they'll do whatever they're told to do. Mm -hmm. But there have been revolutions in Russia too, some fairly highly publicized ones. Mm -hmm. I mean, is Vladimir Putin now in a real make or break situation if there is this counteroffensive? Yeah, I think there's a make and break situation for a lot of people on both sides. Um, I think on Putin's side, well, with the people, yeah, you're never quite sure. I, we've discussed this before. You know, Nicholas Ceausescu in Romania was quite surprised how events unfolded um, and led to him being killed. Um, what about, you know, what about Putin and the people? Well, uh, some of my Russian friends will say that um, it's impossible to have a talk with their uh, mums and dads and brothers and sisters in Russia about this war if they're calling from Canada because. Uh, they, they, they just hear the Russian side and they're fully convinced that what they're doing is the right thing. But then there are others in Russia that uh, obviously know that this is not the case. And we see them going to we see them going to jail and getting these long jail sentences. It's not like they're entirely cut off. And so there is that group there, but they live in fear. You know, that's the thing. We never appreciate this in our own country, that they absolutely live in fear. If they do come out onto the streets, it's not like they can be arrested and go into the court system and then be released and, you know, don't do that again. I mean, it's much worse than that. So, so there would be that um, that group of people waiting for that for an opportunity to come, and then when it does come, it's massive, and, and you're shocked by it. So, so I think I think this is something we just we will watch for on the Ukrainian side. Of course, it's make and break as well because I don't think they would get a second chance to launch um, a, a major counteroffensive. Um, which would probably have to happen in the summer or into the next year, and how much support will you continue to get from you know your allies? You know, so so for them, this is very very important. They have to go at the right time in the right place, and for the right things. And this then leads us down to some interesting situations. Do you um, attempt to liberate the Donbass area? Do you attempt to cut off the Donbass area? Do you drive towards Crimea? attempt to get in there. It's very constrained. The roads are very tight. I mean, I wouldn't want to do it myself if I was in charge of, of the ground forces. It's very delicate, difficult. But if you do, there could be huge gains at a price, though. Um, if you go into Crimea and you start to recapture things, it may look good for you on paper, but the Russians will go absolutely mad over this, right? They'll need to evacuate their people. Um, in Moscow, it will cause all sorts of problems. And then, of course, you'll get more of these threats about nuclear weapons. Um, so, so, Chris, yeah. th this is wonderfully segued into, into our final question, which, which you're by now used to. Uh, and this one will close our discussion. That being, you've framed uh, really um, interestingly what, what, uh, what could, what, what might happen, various options. Our final question, of course, is what do you think will happen? Will Ukraine prevail? Uh, will this war drag into 2024, et cetera? Your thoughts? Well, there's always a case of what I would like to happen and what <laughs> will likely happen, right? Because I've had the maps out on my computer and I've made little lines and 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 said to myself what would i do and to what end you know these things and and uh, more often than not you're you're wrong well what do i think is going to happen well i think um i think 
that all the work we've done with the Ukrainian armed forces is going to prevail at the end of the day. I think there'll be a, what I would call a mini shock and awe campaign. So I'm putting myself out on a limb here, but I think we're going to see a mini shock and awe campaign akin to what the U.S. did um, in Iraq. Um, it will bust through the Russian lines and they will advance until they run out of steam. That is, the Ukrainians will run, you know, they'll advance until they run out of steam because you can only go so far with the people you have, even though you may have a lot of them. Um, and I think it's going to cause absolute panic in Moscow until they can bring stability to the line. And we will then watch watch what happens in Moscow with Putin and his inner circle when they are faced with what are what will be, in my view, a catastrophic setback. Well, Chris Kilford is such a fountain of knowledge. And when it comes to international politics and conflicts, we're very lucky to have him on the Rumble Room and as a um, regular contributor. We'll have him back, though, as soon as things continue to develop in Ukraine and in other countries, unfortunately, in that worn war-torn region. But now we say goodbye to a public figure who doesn't stand for conflict, but rather for humor and the brighter side of life. And for those of us a little bit on the older side, you know, I'm talking about Dame Edna. Dame Edna Everidge. And, you know, I, I used to watch the Dame Edna show on TV and I thought, what's the fuss about? I just thought it was kind of crazy. But this was the brainchild of Australian Barry Humphreys, who has just passed away at the age of 89. He had a number of outrageous characters, but the most outrageous, the most flamboyant, a character that actually toured as a standalone act across the world was Dame Edna Everidge. And uh, you know, I actually saw Dame Edna back 20, 21 years ago, a friend of mine, Chris calls me up. He lived in Vancouver. I was still in Victoria. He said, hey, I've got, tickets to go see Dame Edna. Do you want to come over and see, uh, see a show? So I thought, well, I don't know what I think about Dame Edna Everidge, but I'll check it out. So I went down to the theater and boy, was I in for a surprise. She greeted the room at the Ford Theater, almost immediately spotted a woman who was coming in late to the room to find her seat. And Dame Edna says, Oh, hello, dear. Hello, dear. Welcome, welcome. Oh, come. Oh, don't worry. We'll stop. We'll stop the show and wait for you to find your seat. Oh, go ahead, dear. You can do it. Oh, oh are you comfortable now, dear? Are you all right? And, and what's your name, dear? What's your name? And the woman said, Mary. Oh, Mary, what a lovely name. Isn't that lovely? Mary, so nice of you to come. And, and Mary, can I ask, where, where are you from, Mary? I'm from Kitsilino. Kitsilino, Kitsilino, isn't that wonderful, Mary? I hear it's a beautiful place. That's lovely. And Mary, is Kitsilino very far from here? No, it, it's just across the bridge. Oh, isn't that remarkable, Mary? Because you know, I come all the way from Australia and it's a very, very, very long ways away. And yet somehow I got here on time well, the whole place just went crazy. Dame Edna, a classic, greatly to be missed. And uh, with that, John, we'll, we'll again thank our many viewers and suggest different ways that they can follow the Rumble Room for future shows. Robin, you know, not only do I really appreciate and respect hearing your viewpoints, but you're a flat-out entertainer. You heard that on the Rumble Room. Dame Edna, thank you. Thank you for being on the Rumble Room. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, that's a great story. And uh, and uh, and certainly, in some degree, because I come from a different part of the world, sounds almost as entertaining as Olga, the Croatian lion tamer. That's for another show. That's for another show. Certainly for those that want to follow all of our antics. And boy, oh boy, as it gets a little warmer and a little brighter, I think those antics are going to get better and better by the show follow us on our home page so to speak on facebook you can follow us on twitter obviously we would like to see you subscribe and like our videos on youtube and i'm highlighting that link right now we're also on instagram we're on tiktok we're on numerous facebook groups robin this show has been a ton of fun thank you and for now i remain your Croatian sensation, Johnny Juricic.
and I remain the Croatian sensation's greatest fan, Robin Adair, and rumble on. <laughs> <laughs>